Thank you guys for coming today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Christine Martin. I'm the Curator and Building Director of the Park Chateau Museum. Um, we, sorry. Um, and I would like to welcome you to the second installment this year of the Mining City Writing Project. Uh, we've been doing the Mining City Writing Project for a couple of years now. Um, this program hosts laureate writers, both fiction, nonfiction, and most recently jur journalists. Um, we invite authors to come to Butte and do some research on a topic for a week. Uh, we host this event here at the archives. We also host an event later this week, tomorrow night in fact, at the Chateau, where you'll get the chance to see Chris speak again. Um, and now I would like to turn it over to David McCumber, who is the editor of Montana Standard and a longtime collaborator on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, just uh, a couple quick notes about it. I think uh, it's great this year to have journalists. We've had, we've, as, as Christine mentioned, we've had just a, a variety of, of writers, but um, uh, journalism uh, is, a, I think, a good focus for us this year. And uh, as you, you might remember, we had uh, Bill Lambrecht, uh, a longtime Washington, D.C. journalist here a little earlier in the year. And I'm thrilled that we're able to follow up uh, with Chris Solomon. Chris uh, was a reporter at the Seattle Times for uh, almost six years, I believe. Yeah. Um, since uh, 2002, he has been a freelance journalist, uh, writing about uh, a full range of topics, science, skiing, uh, environmental issues, um, profiles of athletes. He's a con contributing editor at Outside Magazine and at Runner's World. Uh, his work has appeared, uh, appears quite frequently in the New York Times, both in the Sunday Magazine and uh, uh, also he has uh, written in Popular Mechanics, Scientific American, National Geographic, Men's Journal, Ski Magazine, Departures, and, and others. Um, he also writes for the New York Times Travel Section and the Sunday Week in Review occasionally. Um, his, his work has been anthologized several times, uh, six times, in, in uh, Best American Travel Writing, Best American Sports Writing, and Best American Science and Nature Writing. And he's an Alicia Patterson Fellow, which he might tell us a little bit about uh, uh, this year. And he lives in the Methow Valley in, uh, in uh, North Central Washington. And we're just thrilled to have him here in Butte. And uh, without further ado, Chris Solomon. Thanks very much, David and Christine. Um, yeah, uh, again, uh, my name is Chris Solomon. Um, turn your, your mic on. Let me turn on my mic. Yeah. So you can have still more of me. Still um, more of you. <laughs> thank you all for coming. I, you know, full disclosure, I'm used to being out there um, and throwing questions at whoever's here. So this is. Check and see if the green light's on. It is not on. How long do I have to hold it? Hold it down until the green light is on. It is not up. Oh, it is off now. It is, it is now on. Okay. Is that any That's that better. Is better. That's better. That is yeah. there. There is all of me. There is. Um, there you go. You've got it all already. But again, Chris Solomon, <laughs> much more comfortable where you are than where I am. So be gentle. Um, <laughs> thank you for having me. It's really good to be in view. I, uh, I knew very little about you before coming, other than sort of, frankly, some of the slanders that one tends to get just living in the West. So it's really great to be here and start to understand a lot more about the place and realize that it is a much more interesting and rich place than uh, I had expected. So I'm really enjoying myself. So, so thanks very much for coming. Um, I, as I said, I'm much more uh, accustomed to, to sitting in, in the chair at seminars and things than giving the presentation. Um, uh, but I, I wanted to maybe uh, go through and show you some slides and 
I, I was told by a friend who's given many more of these as a journalist, he's like, throw a lot of slides at him, just keeps them distracted no matter how boring you are. So uh, I thought I would uh, show you some slides and, and tell you a little bit about the arc of what I've done in my career, which personally I find kind of interesting, but, uh, but even if you don't, there'll be lots of interesting pictures to look at. And, but, you know, and tell you along the way a little bit about kind of the, how I've sort of thought about what, you know, how I kind of perpetrate journalism these days and, and, and how that has sort of changed and how I've kind of come to um, kind of why I'm doing what I'm doing these days and why I feel it's, a, it's an approach that uh, I find both satisfactory, uh, satisfying and important. Um, uh, yeah, and so, so, so I'll just jump right, right in. Um, and, and I would love to, to talk to you all about any questions you have about you know, anything that I've talked about, or if you want me to defend the fake news media at the end, I'll do my best. Um, really anything you guys want to talk about. Um, or if you do want to interrupt and, and throw a question at me along the way, um, feel free, and I can get all flustered and, uh, and try, <laughs> try to do that. Um, this is the Metha Valley in, in north central Washington state where I live. This is taken uh, this week last year, so it's a little tough to leave right now. It's a really spectacular place. Those are all arrow leaf balsam root, and they grow naturally like that for about two weeks a year. So um, I'm very happy there. Uh, this is, uh, I'll come back to this photo in just one second, but um, a little bit of background about me. I was an Army brat. My father was a military officer. Uh, my mother was an Army nurse when they met, and I was actually born at West Point. Um, and uh, we moved nine times in 17 years, and uh, including Europe twice. But my parents you know, were really great about exposing uh, uh, us to places and cultures, and I think this led to raising a son who had a certain amount of comfort in, in the new experiences and kind of hanging it out there, as it were, and uh, trying new things. Um, my sister is not so much, uh, but uh, I, I think this led to raising, uh, you know, a, a son who wanted to see more of the world and understand that, you know, which are, are all kind of beneficial traits uh, for being a journalist. Um, I, was, I was a typically kind of lost liberal studies, you know, undergrad. I was a ski bum for a year after college and kind of discovered the American West. My family's all on the East Coast, and has always been on the East Coast. Um, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with myself after school. You know, I just knew that I liked to read and I liked to be outside, which <laughs> not particularly marketable <laughs> traits. Um, so I went to graduate school down at the University of Virginia um, and got a master's degree in English, in American literature of all things, at the University um, of Virginia. Uh, and I was thinking as I was starting out in this world as an adult that. You know, I knew that, you know, I love the great outdoors and, you know, and, and uh, you know, and having been a ski bum and traveling and I, and I wanted to be in it as much as possible and I loved reading. Uh, this apparently is called a shelfie. Selfies are out and shelfies are in, I, I've been told, so just so you know. Um, this is the new way to brag. <laughs> anyway, that's a shelfie at home. Uh, and on a related note, I, I, I knew I loved words. I discovered that later than most people who, who write for a living, I, I come to discover sort of in college how much I enjoy just kind of struggling with kind of stitching together words and working on papers. And, and I'd gotten some encouragement in college and took like a journalism course or two at school. And so after graduate school, I couldn't find a job. It, it was you know, one of many sort of I think lacunas in the in the uh, in the uh, in the, uh, in the during the booms in, in journalism when there were such things, and uh, and I I headed west uh, to Seattle. Uh, while in graduate school, I'd seen pictures of the North Cascades, and uh, I'd really fallen in love. Um, I'd also uh, there there had been a terrible Michael Crichton book that had come out called Disclosure. He was a very conservative guy, and he'd, he'd written a book that was an anti, sort of reverse sexual discrimination book called uh, Disclosure, and it was made into an even worse uh, movie with Michael Douglas and uh, Demi Moore, uh, in which Demi Moore is his tech boss, and she sexually harasses him. And he, it's based in Seattle, and then uh, he gets away from Demi Moore's clutches and then rides the ferry back from Seattle to Bainbridge Island. And I was watching the movie in Virginia and I thought, I'm going to Seattle and get sexually harassed by Demi Moore. So there, <laughs> there are all sorts of reasons to go 
to go west. And, uh, and so I did, and uh, I couldn't find a job. I mean, just as a quick aside, I, I applied for this twice-weekly newspaper in, uh, in, in Bremerton, Washington, this very gritty town where there's a naval base. And uh, this young editor said, we're just going to kick the ass of the Bremerton Sun, which is the daily newspaper in town. And I was all excited. And then uh, they had me take this reporting test, which was this basically this they give you a list of facts, and you had to assemble them into a newspaper story. And I really hadn't been a daily newspaper reporter yet. I'd, come, I'd worked at like a ski magazine for a summer, um, in which I was told to write these really pithy, little sexy, little blurbs and things. And so I did that, and I made a sexy little story. Um, but you had to know the rules of reporting and what to use and what not to use. And uh, so I did that, and I uh, handed it in all smug and rode back on the ferry with the wind. You know, my, I think my hair was like Michael Douglas, and uh, <laughs> you know, just feeling like I'd be in Seattle like every night, and uh, and uh, I never got a call back, and the, I finally called the guy, and uh, and he said, well, we gave the job to someone else. I said, okay, and you know, being a plucky young you know guy, I'd been taught to say, well, what could I've done better? And he said, well, we got the results of your test back. And he said, and then I've never forgotten this. He said, you show no aptitude as a general assignment reporter whatsoever. <laughs> and, uh, two weeks later, I was hired by the Seattle Times and as, a, as an intern, and two years later, I was freelancing for the New York Times. So I don't say that to brag. I just, said, I just it's always, it's always been just an interesting moment that you never know kind of where you're going to end up uh, in life. I have no idea where that is. Um, so I worked for the. Uh, Seattle Times for five and a half years, first as an intern and then as a reporter. And it was sort of my graduate school in, in journalism. Uh, I did everything from, you know, uh, writing, uh, I wrote a profile of Montana writer Rick Bass, who you all are familiar with. I yeah. went out to the, uh, the, uh, the Yak Valley and spent the, spent the day and a half with him. Um, I covered city council meetings in the suburbs of Seattle. I uh, timber theft on the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State. Um, I was, you know, a cub reporter, and I went out and, and spent time uh, with the, the macaw when they, uh, the, the Indian tribe there, um, uh, killed their first whale in uh, 80 years as part of their treaty rights. Um, so just fascinating experiences. It, it was it was a tremendous experience. Um, you know, and, and I guess one thing that has been kind of a recurring, I think theme and being a reporter is always feeling a little bit of an imposter, and I, and I guess I want to re return to this later, but, but I think this is one, what I mean by that is I think I came to journalism, I think originally not for the reason I think some other people come to journalism, which there's an old saw about wanting to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Which is, which is a great phrase, you know, you know, sort of that inspiration of like um, Sinclair Lewis, I believe it was, right, uh, author of The Jungle, right, and really wanting to right wrongs. And I, I came to journalism for much more selfish, I think, motivations. I just, I wanted to write, and I wanted to write a lot, you know, that, um, and I wanted to write nice things, you know, I think, I think, uh, I think it's Calvin Trillin who has a book called uh, Deadline Poet, um, and, and he literally would write doggerel. Uh, but quite, quite nice you know, poetry on deadline. Um, and that was what excited me about journalism, uh, was the chance to write a lot. Uh, and it was a great experience working in a newspaper, but it it's also could be challenging for someone who came at it with those motives, uh, motivations, because daily newspaper work is, is hard, grinding work and it's 90% reporting and often it's 10% banging on the keyboard at four in the afternoon and it's very stressful and I found it fairly unpleasant um, and it's incredibly important work. I just wasn't, um, it wasn't necessarily what was best for me um, and so, and, and also I, I struggled to cover things like city council meetings and things well. Like it, again, it, I read those stories, I find them really valuable, but it wasn't necessarily, you know, we're, we also things that were better, that are, that are in our wheelhouse, and that, I didn't bring much value added to those stories, I guess I wouldn't say. I would think going out and spending time with, with this and bringing and noticing color and detail in stories like this, I think I was a little better at, but they didn't need me to do that very much. Um, so in 2002, I left to become a freelance writer, and I, I wanted to do different kinds of work on a different timetable, 
and, and, and uh, cover, and looking for the chances to write often longer, which writers are always complaining they don't get to write longer. But I wanted to try to do that as well. Um, and for, for years, for several years, I was a travel writer, um, writing about the outdoors and, and often outdoor adventure travel, as the, as the cliche was. And it was really, it was really good to me. Uh, I got to go helicopter skiing in Sweden for the New York Times. Um, and helicopter skiing off the back of a 200-foot mega yacht off the British Columbia coast for Ski Magazine, which I highly recommend. <laughs> um, and uh, fishing in Colorado, also for the New York Times. And um, one of my favorite things of all time, went up to Alaska for high country news to a place called McNeil River um, Sanctuary, home to the biggest seasonal congregation of the, some of the largest bears on earth. Um, it is a highly restricted area. Only 10 visitors at a time, chosen by lottery. And it is not unusual to stand on the side of the McNeil River in high season, in, in midsummer, and watch 40 bears in the McNeil River eating salmon, catching salmon at once. The record at McNeil River is 73 bears in the river at once. And it is completely managed for the bears. So you are sitting in a golf chair, a camp chair, next to the river. And the bears will sometimes grab a salmon and run away from their competitors and sit down and eat it 10 feet from you. And it is terrifying and <laughs> exhilarating. And they have not, in, not since they have um, instituted the rules um, to, to control access and, and, and other things, uh, they haven't, there has been no bare human incident in like, in like 30 years. They haven't had to shoot a bear, no bear has attacked a human in 30 or 40 years. Um, it is a fascinating place. And then, and I was able to write a long feature story that's in the Best Morning Travel Writing um, anthology this, this past year about that. Um, so, uh, so, so some pretty neat experiences. Uh, travel writing was, was, was very good to me, and you get to live above your means as a, as a freelance writer. Um, flying around, uh, I do not go heli skiing on my own dime. Um, I don't afford to. Um, but my point in lingering on all this, you know, in addition to just being able to show some fun slides, is that, um, is to kind of talk a little bit about the journey I guess I was on and, and where, where I was going with this, is that travel, after a few years travel writing, um, I know people who stick with it for a very long time, um, but to me, it began to feel a little bit hollow. Um, and it felt, it felt limiting in some ways, just by its nature, too. Um, travel writing tends to have some guardrails on it. Um, you always got to say how much the hotel room costs and how comfortable the beds are and things like that, generally speaking. And it's not that interesting sometimes to, to, to write about. But also, travel writing uh, felt a little bit like eating cotton candy. Um, it's just not that substantive often, and it often doesn't fill you up. As a, as, a, as a journalist and a writer. Um, I guess I wanted to do more, and uh, spending so much time outside and getting familiar with these um, places and these issues, it was hard not to notice how the outdoors and the environment were continuing to feel pressure and, uh, of, of different kinds in our, um, in our changing world. Oh, well, one more. This is Annie Akchak National Monument up in Alaska. One more place that we went to, I forgot to show it. Uh, the least visited national park property in the United States, which was another another trip um, for Outside Magazine. Uh, pretty spectacular place. But where I was going with that, that was one more great trip. <laughs> but um, you know, there so many changes to land use or pollution, or of course climate change. You know, or you know, increasing severity of wildfires. You know, it was hard not to keep reading. You know about all these issues. You know as we're, as we're all doing. Um, this is um, in a side valley to the Meadow Valley where I live. Um, after the Carlton Complex fire came through about five years ago, um, 
this is uh, this is a friend's house. Uh, Benj Drummond and Sarah Steele, they're, they're environmental filmmakers, and that Benj took this picture after three waves of the fire came through in I think two days, and burned everything uh, in the upper uh, Beaver Creek Valley uh, except their home. Uh, just amazing. Um, you know, and I'm sure you guys can all relate to, to that kind of um, catastrophe these days. <clears throat> so increasingly, you know, where I'm going with this is that I felt a desire to to write about these things. Um, this felt more pressing, more relevant, more important than the work I was doing. You know, and I guess I just want to stay, step back briefly here, and you know, and just say, you know, for all the battering it has taken of late, you know, journalism I think really does have a, you know, a power is a powerful force to inform and explain these days. You know, it can really, <clears throat> you know, it can really help people understand things. You know, despite you know the sort of the the. the the pressure that, it, that journalism is under these days. I mean, obviously, I'm biased, but I, I feel that, that reporters um, do have a really important role to play, and I wanted to, to, to take part in that, uh, and I didn't feel like I really was. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't feel it's inappropriate to say, as someone who was writing, being outside so much, that, you know, I did feel a sense of stewardship, and a sense, you know, as an American, as a human being, you know, and I felt I wanted to, uh, I wanted to have, have uh, I wanted to bring more attention to these kinds of issues. So, anyway, this is where the threads that I sort of introduced at the start, I think, sort of come together. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's so much importance right now in, in what we as journalists call hard news, we, you know, which is the stuff that's usually just on the front page of the newspaper every day. Um, you know, the stuff about the Mueller report, you know, it's just one instance. And I am a huge consumer of that kind of news. Um, it's tremendously important. Um, that said, you know, as, as I kind of alluded to before, like, that, I'm not particularly great at that kind of, that, uh, reporting that kind of news. That's just not my, I'm not a great investigative reporter, and, and I've known that for a while. And, and so I've, I have tried, been trying to figure out over time as journalists, like, what am, what am I good at? What can I bring? How can I contribute? To how can I contribute and uh, yeah, make a contribution um, given the things that I do well, and and also the question is when you and me are just getting battered right by news. I mean, the, the, the cliche is the fire hose of information. How can how can I as a journalist um, get through get through to you and, and and make you pay attention to something I find? Is important and valuable. Like when so, you know, there's ten stories in Meghan Markle's new baby, and there's something, the latest something that's happened with Trump. You know, how do I try and reach through that fire hose and and, uh, and tell you, hey, there's something else going on here. I really think that you, you you're going to want to know about. And the and the and the and the, the the conclusion that I've come to, and the thing that I've been trying to do, I guess, is is, is that. I've been trying to tell stories. And what I mean by that is stories in the old-fashioned sense of the word. Um, narratives uh, with, with well-drawn characters, and with plot, and with tension, and with resolution, if, if there is a resolution. Um, you know, I'm hardly the first person you know, to, to recognize that these kinds of narratives are you know are the way we human beings kind of kind of understand the world and how we teach each other lessons and how we share information how we warn each other about things you know ever since we, you know had you know sat around a campfire in a cave and they've drawn things on the wall and grunted at each other um, and so th this is I feel like I'm kind of rambling a little bit but what I'm trying to say is that this is where I feel like some of the things that I do a little bit better as a journalist. Are, are, are better fitted to these kinds of magazine-like stories uh, where you can bring these kind of storytelling techniques. Um, and so these are the kind of stories I like to read. I'll read that front page news, but I also want to I also want to read a story where I can really connect with someone as a person and really empathize with them. I think these kinds of stories really let us connect with other people as, as people. And I think that's the way that we can also often make uh, la uh, 
lasting connections and really um, change, change each other's minds and see each other um, and understand each other. Um, so that's what I've been trying to do. Um, this is just a quick example of just a couple of the books that have been written for writers, sort of about how plots work, about how human beings tell stories. And some of them are non, the one on the right's about nonfiction, but the ones, the one in the middle is about fiction, but the one on the left is sort of both, it's fiction and nonfiction. It's just, I just threw those in there because it's sort of fascinating about how in life and in art, we tell ourselves stories and, and they follow the same kinds of arcs. And it's just, it's, it's really interesting to see that 10, 10 or 15 kinds of patterns, you know, or even fewer, just emerge over time. Um, so it's interesting to study those as, as a journalist, even if reality sometimes makes them a little messy. Um, a hero, you know, the giant attacks the village, you know, the village is smashed, someone has to do something, the reluctant hero emerges and has to head out into the woods to do something about it. You know, you know that's one example of, a, of an archetypal plot um, that, uh, that, that many of our stories follow. It's just one example. Um, anyway, so this is all to say that over the last dozen years, I've been, I've been pivoted, as I've pivoted to more science and environmental writing, I've just tried to do so with the goal of um, trying to tell these kind of narrative stories and trying to tell them kind of artfully and memorably, which sort of scratches that itch I mentioned in the beginning of just really liking to put words together. Um, um, so one of the pieces that I think worked out particularly well was the prof a profile of uh, Kathy Bura for Outside Magazine. Um, and I, I pardon me for putting that up. It's a little gory. That's, uh, that's a whale at her feet. Um, but the picture's so good. Kathy is a veterinary pathologist up in Alaska. And she has looked about inside just about every dead animal up in Alaska. And uh, she's basically a detective. She looks for what kills, has killed them. And as the far north warms uh, under climate change, um, uh, the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. She's finding all sorts of weird stuff, weird disease, stuff that has migrated to the north, all sorts of interesting stuff, Mys mysteries, basically. She's, so she's a detective um, finding mysteries and trying to suss out the answers. So I went up and lived in Anchorage. She lives outside of Anchorage, and I sublet an apartment and hung out with her for about a month uh, while she uh, cut up whales on the tide flats, and baby moose and uh, sea otters, these incredibly cute animals that um, have been dying in huge numbers and that she, uh, she's probably cut up more of than anybody on Earth, uh, which is a dubious distinction. <laughs> um, but she's this delightful woman. She's so sweet uh, and so funny. And yet here she does this very, you know, what could be considered a very macabre job. Um, but so it, so a story about a human being, about, about what frankly would be a really, I wouldn't necessarily read that story for very long if it didn't have a human being in it, because it's, it's really, it's, well, it's way up there, you know, it's very esoteric. But she really brought it to life. Um, another story a few years ago occurred at the end of the Obama administration, uh, a Utah congressman uh, named Rob Bishop was trying to solve the half-century-old wilderness wars in the eastern half of Utah by striking what, he, what they called a grand bargain that would bring just about everybody to the table and settle the land use claims over millions of acres of land, um, including places like this in San Juan County. Um, you can see, of course, the, the very old cliff dwellings there. Um, and this is down near the Four Corners area. Um, so I wrote about that attempt, and I, you know, and I, and I spent time with all the personalities and tried to, tried to show the incredible passions involved and make these real people, you know, and not just make this just a pretty two-dimensional politics sort of story. Um, this effort imploded um, after being really fascinating and, and, and really making some headway. Um, and what President Obama did as he was walking out the door was declare a little monument you might have since heard of it's called the Bears Ears National Monument. I won't, I won't lie to you, these stories can be very um, hard to do, at least from my perspective. Um, reality is much messier than fiction. Um, you can't control, sometimes there is no resolution, like in this case. 
it just, you know, it didn't, it didn't end neatly. Um, this is my writing desk trying to write that story, <laughs> um, which coincidentally, as I was going through trying to find that slide, I, I noticed that it looks a lot like a freelance writer's desk during tax season. <laughs> I, don't I, don't know what, I don't know what connection to make during that, but uh, for that, but uh, I'll, I'll just show you just, just one, or two, uh, one or two more uh, stories. Another story uh, published this last summer, but I thought you guys could relate to it. Um, it was published in the New York Times Magazine. It was about the brutal world of, of wolf politics in Washington State. Um, and well, thank you for saying that. Um, and again, like wolf politics, like who, that is an ugly story to write about. Like, and it's and it's just been going on forever and ever. And like, that is not a story, frankly, that I would really want to write about because I don't, I don't really like to read process stories. I don't really want to write about a process story. Um, there, I'm not good at those, except for this guy. And his name, his name is Rob Wilgus, and he is fascinating. Uh, some people have other words for him. He, he was a large carnivore um, uh, ecologist, uh, biologist, at Washington State University. Um, unlike most scientists, he's an incredibly big mouth. Um, and he had been recruited after doing some groundbreaking work on cougars and bears. Very, um, very, um, unconventional work about what happens to large carnivores when they meet civilization. They act very differently than, than uh, anticipated. He was recruited to start working on wolves in Washington State, and he started to find different things about wolves, and he also is not shy about telling people they are wrong and they should listen to him. And I don't need to tell you Montanans that if you are impolitic about wolves, sheep are the only thing that are going to get slaughtered. And he, rightly or wrongly, got run out of that academia. And uh, with a little help from some Washington State legislators. And it's a fascinating story. Uh, and Everybody was mad at everybody again after Washington State's attempt to after Washington State's attempt to do it right and make and avoid all the mistakes that Idaho and Montana and Wyoming and uh, to avoid all those mistakes everybody else made they made them all again and with no little help from him so so he he was he drove he drove the story he drove the story. Um, and he made it, he was a person, you know, this, is, this is not a phrase that people like. I use, this, I use this phrase with a scientist. I said, I'm looking for a mule to carry the load. And the scientist I, I didn't really like that idea that he would be a mule to carry the load. For but, but that's what you're, you're kind of looking for, someone to help readers understand what's going on. And, you know, and it just makes, you know, and I don't say this flippantly, um, or sensationalistically, it's just someone to help you understand the story and relate to. He's a very flawed human being, which we can all relate to. You know? So, so anyways, that, that was the story that came out last July in the New York Times. Um, so this, I guess this just brings me back, I'm almost finished. Um, this just brings me back, I guess, to the imposter feeling. You know, um, you know, most freelance writers like me, we're just complete dilettantes, especially someone like, someone like me. I flit around from story to story. I don't have a beat, you know, like, like Susan. Um, I know a little about a lot. I'm, I'm great for like, three minutes at cocktail party. Um, uh, and I'm not a scientist. I was an English major, um, not even a very good one. And, and so I used to think that was a liability, but I think it's really become a, an attribute, a benefit, because, an asset is what I'm trying to say, because I, I think I'm a stand-in for, for the reader, because I'm, I'm reasonably intelligent, reasonably, um, but, uh, but I'm curious, and I want to know what's going on, and I need to understand it 
just as my so I can explain it to my readers. And uh, and so and so I take the time to do it. Um, I always think of uh, an anecdote the great John McPhee tells about himself, which is I mean McPhee. <laughs> I won't flatter myself by extending it that I'm like McPhee, but McPhee would um, would understand something, but he didn't, he wanted, he'd spend time with his subject so long, he'd just keep asking them questions about the topic, keep asking them questions, and finally the, his, the guy, or the geologist or something, would say, gah, look, it's like this, and then they would give him just the perfect analogy, Perfect quote, and he and he and McPhee was like, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I wanted. And he, but it's it's logging that time, playing the dummy, and usually being the dummy, but not not pretend, not ever thinking you know more than you do, or pretending you know more than you do until you really get the goods. Um, and so I think there's a real asset to to being an ignorant. Um, so. Uh, so this is all to say, I, today I continue to gravitate to these stories, I think, where humans intersect with the natural environment and, and complications ensue, and then, and then trying to linger there as long as you can. Um, uh, so I'll just, uh, I'll just to tell you what I'm working on now, and then, and then we're, I'll be done. Uh, I just proposed another story and had it assigned about the future of kind of, kind of freshwater fishing. Um, the habitat for cold water fishes uh, nationwide, such as cutthroat trout or bull trout, uh, such as this one up in uh, British, southern British Columbia, you know, brook trout, gila trout in the southwest, and other fish is, you know, is expected to precipitously decline under climate models. And this is not completely new, but it's, um, it was kind of new to me when I came across some of, the, some of the studies, and I thought, you know, this is really fascinating um, because I'm not only a fisherman myself, but because it seemed a topic that really cuts through the noise and all the argument we have, political argument and partisan bickering we have today, because it, I know people who, who love Trump, who love to fish, and I know people who are aging hippies who, who fish in the valley where I live, and I know, you know recent immigrants who fish, and like it's something that's very dear to so many of us. Uh, and um, I think, that's taken away from us. I think it's a gut punch to so many people. And I think it's, I, I, I want to find those, for lack of a better term, like pressure points where, again, points of empathy, I guess, um, in, for environmental stories. So, so that's why this story, I think, really appeals to me. And so, um, you know, and, and I don't need to tell you, you know, that fishing is a pastime that sort of, um, you, know, uh, you know, that transcends class. And, and things like that. It drives economies. Um, this is this is Steamboat, uh, Colorado in the summer, but it could be you know, bigger version of Venice, Montana, or another another town in Montana. Um, you know, it uh, you know it's it's a real bond bonding between friends and families, generations of families, a real part of the culture of the West. So, um, I guess I would just say you know the way I've been thinking about it is, given the models and the studies that are coming out, we're we're kind of fishing at dusk right now. Um, unless <clears throat> something is done, which it doesn't appear that anything is going to get done. And so uh, I'll be out in western Montana later this summer spending time with a fishing guide thinking about these questions and hopefully telling the story again through a lot of it through her um, up in the uh, up in northwest Montana. Um, so I think I went much longer than I intended to because I think I'm a secret ham. But uh, that's kind of that's kind of what I wanted to share with you all is a little bit about the arc of kind of what I've been thinking about, and I'd love to talk to you about any of that or or any other questions you had. Um, I don't know what journalism's future holds, but I can try to fake it. Do you have any questions about that? <laughs> <laughs>